Welcome, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming today. Thank you for, for, for participating in what I think is going to be a good conversation about uh, reforming research culture and improving um, uh, um, research evaluation. And I'm very happy today to introduce our panel members from uh, the organizations that are doing so much work to uh, improve research assessment. So on the panel today, this is a continuation of a, of a conversation that we've had a couple of times in the past, most recently from the um, culminating event that uh, NASA supported for the Year of Open Science Initiative. Uh, but on the panel today, I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, Haley Hazlitt from the Declaration of um, Research Assessment. Dora is over 10 years, you celebrated your 10 year anniversary not too long ago. Um, and Dora has been doing a lot um, in that time to really move the needle and um, make sure that uh, everyone is aware about the better ways to evaluate research and what um, institutions and, and universities can be doing to improve research culture. So we're very happy to have Haley on the panel today. Uh, Coming up next will be Caitlin Carter from Helios, the Higher Education Leadership Initiative for Open Scholarship. Uh, Helios is uh, working to build communities of practice for uh, universities and institutions that perform research uh, and sharing resources for what they can do to, again, improve research culture and, and focus on uh, research outputs that demonstrate best practice and in, in an open and transparent and reproducible science. And last but not least, I'm very happy um, that Eva Menendez is joining us today as well. Um, Eva is on the steering board of COARA, the Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment. Um, and uh, Eva will be representing the, a lot of the voices that are outside of the US and um, sharing with us uh, advances that are particularly taking place in Europe and um, elsewhere uh, around these topics. The format today is going to be, as I mentioned, a panel discussion. So each uh, each leader is going to have about 10 minutes or so to give a, a brief overview of what they're doing, um, resources that are available and activities as they see them that are moving the needle towards more uh, open research practices. Um, after that, we'll be opening it up for discussion. As the moderator for today's session, I'll take the prerogative with the first couple of questions. And I do hope that everybody um, listening in will uh, use the Q&A function. And as those questions come in, we'll um, field them to, uh, to one or, or all of our esteemed panel members. So again, um, welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm going to stop uh, sharing this screen right now, if I can find the little red button. And I'm going to uh, pass it over to Haley. Haley, take it away. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, David. Um, as David said, I'm uh, Dr. Haley Hazlett, uh, Program Manager for the Declaration on Research Assessment. And I am incredibly honored to be here today. I'll kick us off by talking a little bit about what DORA is, who our authors audience is and how we work to advance uh, research events. and their work. And we refer to this as responsible research assessment. Now, you may have noticed the word declaration is in our name. And this is because DORA, in addition to being a global initiative that is campaigning for change and supporting policy and practice change around the world, um, we are also a declaration um, that contains a set of recommendations for how many different actors in the scholarly ecosystem, researchers, publishers, funders, data providers and institutions uh, can try to better assess research on its own merits. So individuals and organizations um, can sign the declaration to signal their support and commitment to reforming research assessment. And as of an hour ago, when I checked, we have exactly or had exactly 25,000 
organizations and individuals that have signed DORA around the world, which is a big landmark for us. So, um, you know, when you become a signatory of DORA, there are several broad themes that run through the declaration that you are committing to supporting. So these include not using journal-based metrics as a surrogate measure of quality, being explicit about the criteria used for hiring, promotion, tenure, and funding decisions, and also being transparent about those criteria, and considering the value and impact of a broad range of research outputs. And as uh, David said, uh, DORA celebrated its 10th anniversary last year, and uh, we're looking forward to continuing our work uh, into the next 10 years and beyond. So uh, who does DORA work with? So I already said that we are a global nonprofit initiative. Um, and as I think many of us on the call can understand research assessment really is very closely tied with research culture. And um, we take a systems approach to what is a systems problem. So it impacts everyone. Um, so we try to work to across the system to address culture, infrastructure, and conditions. Um, in the entire scholarly community that all contribute to and determine how research is assessed. So this includes working with, you know, anyone from researchers, research funders, publishers, academic institutions, and everyone in between. Um, so that's really our audience and that is our community. Um, so uh, that's a big, you know, that's a big community. Uh, how do you uh, reform research assessment on that global scale across so many different communities and disciplines. Um, there's really no one size fits all approach to this. And um, to help catalyze this change, we really take a threefold uh, approach um, to uh, working, working across uh, many different disciplines and actors uh, across the world. So um, we, First, facilitate community engagement uh, for collective learning. So, for example, DORA hosts two communities of practice, one for research funders and uh, one for other initiatives like DORA. This allows these communities to gather together to share advances in their work to support responsible research assessment um, and also allows them to avoid duplication of work, creates opportunities for working together, and keeps everyone up to date on what leaders in the space are doing as we all collectively push forward um, in manners that are appropriate for our, our unique contexts. Uh, we also host free uh, events for all of our community members. So this is these focus on topics relevant to them. Uh, so for example, in the past, we've hosted uh, panels on how the pandemic impacts hi impacted hiring and promotions, or how preprints could potentially be leveraged for early career researchers to better gain recognition for their work. Um, so that's the community engagement piece, which directly intersects with the next strategy that we use, which is knowledge sharing. So uh, over the past six years or so that DORA has, you know, been a global initiative working to support change, you know, one of the biggest hurdles that we keep hearing from organizations, particularly academic institutions that are trying to reform their practices, is that, you know, there's really a paucity of good examples of where to start, how to implement that change, what does change look like at a department, at an institution, and, Dora has tried to fill this gap by creating infrastructure for sharing of knowledge and to showcase what reform looks like practically. So I have a few examples of how Dora does this. Uh, we host and curate a resource library that has everything from primary literature on uh, research assessment practices to um, policies and practices from a range of uh, members of the community. Uh, we manage a repository of case studies, which are real deep granular dives into how mostly academic institutions implement change. And we've got really great examples of the, the who, the how, the what, the why, um, and you can really get a great holistic overview of what change looks like, what type of challenges you can encounter, and how you can try to overcome those challenges. 
Uh, and this year, we also launched Reformscape, which is a database of openly um, available research assessment policies and practices uh, at academic institutions. So Reformscape is, uh, you know, the, the blown up version of our case study repository. Uh, it's not as granular as the case studies, but it's got hundreds of examples of how academic institutions are implementing reform. And this is across many different disciplines, many different geographic regions. Um, and it's really meant to, one, help academic institutions or departments or schools share the work that they're doing. So if you reform your hiring practices, for example, and you feel that, you know, you would like to share that with your peer organizations uh, to showcase that work, you can submit that to Reformscape to be, you know, included in the database. Uh, and then uh, Reformscape also serves to help folks who are trying to implement change themselves find those examples that are most relevant to them to give them a good starting point or to help them scale their efforts. Uh, and finally, uh, the, the third approach that Dora uses is to develop resources to support change. So, um, you know, Dora creates tools and um, uh, guidance that can all be found in our resource library uh, that help to implement change. So we really want to support the champions and the folks who are, you know, at academic institutions or funding organizations um, to do the work and to feel like they are supported as they are trying to advocate for responsible research assessment. So for example, um, we recently released guidance on responsible use of quantitative indicators in research assessment. So things like journal impact factor and H index. And this guidance includes some general principles on um, the use of indicators. And uh, that can be found on our website, and I'll pop a link to that in the chat in just a second. Uh, we also have tools on, you know, addressing unconscious biases in academic assessment, de-biasing uh, committee composition, and revisualizing how um, how impact can be recognized in an academic career beyond, you know, simple publications. Um, so uh, there's a lot of really great resources, uh, but I'll conclude that's the whirlwind tour of uh, how DORA works to implement reform on a global scale. Uh, and I'll stop it here and hand it back to you, David. Thanks. Haley, thanks for that whirlwind tour. <laughs> You're certainly doing a lot, and there are uh, a lot of great resources and examples for others to, to learn from, and we'll um, I'll probably ask you to, uh, uh, here's a preview of the first uh, question that we'll come to afterwards, but uh, if you can pick your favorite resource that's been shared or example, uh, that's going to come up. But before then, um, I'm very happy to give the um, podium, the virtual podium to Caitlin Carter from Helios. Uh, Caitlin, uh, unmute yourself and take it away. All right, and um, I think we we intentionally went in this um, order because we're we're so inspired by the work of Dora. I don't think Helios Open would exist without it. And um, again, I'll, I'll turn it over to Ava after this because you know they're really working on a global scale. But here in the United States. We are the Higher Education Leadership Initiative for Open Scholarship. And so we use the term scholarship um, sort of as a, an inclusive umbrella term, noting that there are some of the challenges, uh, there are challenges in sort of, you know, different disciplines seeing themselves in the open science movement. So stepping back, um, Helios Open is a project that emerged from the National Academy's Roundtable on Aligning Incentives for Open Science. So this is a roundtable that brought together senior leaders from, and senior leaders specifically, from universities, funding agencies, professional societies, foundations, philanthropies, um, and industry. And so what they did was they discussed, you know, what are these barriers um, to adopting open, open science practices and rewarding them? And then what are some of the opportunities that we have as leaders to do something about it? And so four leaders emerged. Um, and so President Michael Crow from Arizona State University, President Rosalind Artis from Benedict College, and President Ron Daniels from Johns Hopkins University, as well as Danny Anderson, who's President Emeritus Trinity University, issued a Dear Colleague letter to um, their peers at U.S. institutions, campuses, and said, join us. This is our call to action to basically promote collective action towards advancing 
evaluation reform and in adopting incentives for open science. And so 65 institutions answered that call and said, we want to do something too. And so at the time, um, for the first two years of the initiative, we really just wanted to hear from the institutions that um, signed up and said, we want to join you about what their priorities are for really moving the needle in open science, um, because we saw our open scholarship. We saw that, you know, there are, of course, a lot of barriers, but um, one is that the, the buy-in from the highest level of leadership is um, was, was missing in this context. We've grown to 103 institutions, and so it's, it's kind of a big ship to sail um, with U.S. institutions across, um, you know, uh, liberal arts colleges, teaching colleges, research institutions, um, historically black colleges, um, and other MSIs. And so we do want to basically not solve for one, it's really for all types of institutions in the US. So again, from 2022 to 2024, we ran working groups based on what our members surfaced as priority areas. And so all of this would um, then support the end goal of incentives reform. But the first is, you know, um, specific to that is the actually drafting the guidance for students and faculty to clearly and succinctly articulate um, good practices for sharing specific forms of open scholarship. So papers, data, protocols, methods, et cetera. Um, there it was a working group focused on collaborating with other institutions on shared resourcing and infrastructure decision making. There was one on um, identifying, again, really on the nose with the theme here, but policy language that can be adopted and adapted by departments on campuses and or across the entirety of the institution. And then um, finally, there was one on cross-sector alignment, really also staying true to the National Academy's roundtable approach of having you know, philanthropy and professional society and government agency, et cetera. So we did some work. Um, we collaborated with the um, with NASA on the federal government's year of open science. And so this is really, you know, in, in August 2022, many of you may be familiar with um, the fact that Alondra Nelson released her memorandum um, from OSTP calling on all agencies to update their plans for public access. And so this really blew the door wide open for U.S. federal funding. I think it's about $90 billion in federal funding that goes out and the papers and data associated with those papers now will need to be immediately um, or soon will need to be made immediately available upon publication. So what we did is we issued a, or we wrote an issue brief with members of the National Academy's roundtable, really targeted towards presidents and provosts saying, it's not only um, that we need to do this because um, open science and what that does for you know accessibility and equity and impact, um, that and transparency into our institutions is important because it's in line with our values, but now it's in line with federal requirements and all of these, you know, research grants that you're going to need to grapple with as well. Um, and so we collaborated with NASA on the year of open science. And by doing that, one of the things, and I'll, I'll probably show you later, I think there's a question about um, the types of resources that are available. Um, is we, we surface some of the examples of policy language. So uh, throwing out a couple of examples, the University of Vermont as part of um, I think inspired by some of our work in the Nelson Memorandum, they passed a faculty senate resolution calling on all schools and departments to adopt open science and scholarship within their um, schools and departmental policies. So we've collected some of those resources, the language in the faculty senate resolution. University of Maryland's department chair in psychology has long been um, a really, really, you know, first mover in this area. So he, Mike Doherty, he has shared with us the faculty guidelines for, you know, hiring and advancement that explicitly have embedded reproducible, re reproducible science um, and open science within them. Um, and then we have a few other resources on the website, just in case I'll, I'll share a link with you, um, you know, focused on decision making, uh, it, contextualizing some open source um, infrastructure, for example, within the decision making process, and then also governance um, considerations. We also have a testimonials page that's from different senior leaders across and the different institutions, including um, EVAs, where Center for Open Science is, is based. So, for example, Phil Bourne, who's the associate dean for the School of Data Science, um, has also adopted, uh, you know, data sharing and some of those types of practices within the tenure and promotion guidelines to reward those practices. And so he shared with us not only the language that is in the policy, but also his story about like how he started this initiative and how he basically went through a reform process. 
So since um, we have, you know, done all this groundwork, we've come across it, we'll talk about this, I'm sure, a few barriers, you know, it's really difficult to um, deal with some of that diffusion of responsibility. Um, even if we have leaders, a lot of times we have, you know, even provosts in our, in our network that say, it's not my responsibility, I would never step on the faculty's toes. And then at the same time, we have faculty at the same institution saying we can't because our provost won't sign off on any of these changes. And so a lot of the work was really tackling that. Um, Dora and Cora have been really successful in you know, making sure that there are statements and commitments and principles. Um, that has not resonated with US leaders here, at least in, in what we've tried to do. So we've done some pivoting and what we have done was really, um, is as part a few things is really really re-energizing and engaging and holding accountable the the highest level of leadership that we're able to within our network so moving forward and based on the momentum from a workshop we held that was nasa funded at florida international university in miami in january so this was sort of like a culminating workshop for our work um, and kind of driving forward the new priorities we engaged 50 or we had attend 50 senior level leaders. So these were presidents, provosts, vice presidents for research and faculty affairs who came to a workshop to talk about these initiatives and then surface some ideas for next steps they can take as leaders on their campuses to basically change culture through the lens of um, open science or open scholarship reform. So we have from that um, had a lot of momentum and some new directions that we're really excited about. We brought on Danny Anderson, who was one of the original um, presidents who signed the letter to work with me. So for the next year, um, he's leading some of the senior engaged. He's a special advisor for you know senior leadership engagement. He is chairing a Helios Open Executive uh, Council that is formed that is presidents, provosts, and v vice presidents to guide some of the um, the next steps with the research assessment work. And then there are you know working groups and affinity groups within that that will carry be carrying some of this work forward. He is, as we speak, checking in with the leaders from that Miami workshop, seeing what their next steps are, what resources they need, and then how we can um, call on wonderful groups that are like, you know, Dora and Kuara for, for guidance or um, develop resources ourselves or tap into some of the resources within the Helios Open Campus Network. At the same time, um, from the work that we did, we have this really robust, I think, 200 plus person network of the community. So um, initially, we asked the senior leaders to designate a campus representative to join a working group because those specific working groups have been sunset. Um, we have now still in, in place this group. And so we have several programs like community calls, um, community led affinity groups, or working groups that have emerged. And so we have an advisory council with active members and former working group co leads as well. I think I'll stop there. Um, I just want to make sure we have time, but uh, thanks again for for having us, um, David. Caitlin, that, yeah, that, those are all sort of great activities, and I um, like your example of kind of um, you know passing the buck. You one one party uh, says, yeah, you know, we can't step on faculty toes. Faculty says we can't sort of go against university, and it really sort of you know takes everybody kind of in the room at the same time, um, working on the same problem together to to hopefully make something a little bit more meaningful. Um, and we see that all across the, the research ecosystem. And we might find some other examples through the conversation um, that's coming up. But um, last but not least, I'm very happy to uh, pass the virtual podium to Eva Menendez from uh, the Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment, Eva. Thank you very much, David. Kind introduction and thank you for the the previous speakers, because you have to have the ground, and I only need to just team in and there and in, and inquire. Uh, when you mentioned David that well, from out of the U.S., I have to clarify Quara is out of the U.S., but Quara is a global initiative. It's not a European project. The only thing is that half the, I mean, I would say the the good luck of the European Commission funding to push up uh, the initiative and make it happen through a European project that is called Push. But uh, Quara is an endeavor. Uh, everybody in the world is invited. Uh, absolutely. I'm very interested, particularly, that to have its own because I think 
Russell Global, such a value should be global too. Uh, I cannot just tell my students to uh, perform such a way that they are going to be evaluated in Europe and then want to apply for a full referendum. They are going to have certain different criteria. This is absurd and it doesn't make sense really. But um, uh, let me just uh, tell you a bit more how COARA came in this scenario and why I want to just be global because I think that there is the only way to go. I have also in our steering board meetings, Dora, an observer. We have also FOLEC, which is a, a, a Latin American initiative for such as uh, an evaluation. We want to get more people want to have different members. One of the different of the research evaluation principle that we are um, just facing in course is that we want to have everybody at the same level, but also we have this is national chapters level. We are very keen on letting the country to adapt principles. The the ARA, the agreement that is our baseline uh, where we are standing off. Um, we are standing from a, a principle very similar to DORA principle or the EOS uh, initiatives. But I, I, sorry. I'm very sorry to interrupt. I, we're having a little bit of problem with the audio. Um, Can I, I put just... my video? Maybe work, maybe better. Yeah, that might work. Yes, usually works. Um, by the way, I'm in Australia, so that's why Boar is so global. Uh, maybe that is a, a bit, uh, no, very good connection today. Um, well, what it was, uh, I, if, if you don't understand me, just uh, stop me and I will try to do differently. I what I improved. want Thank to you. underline Okay, good. Yes, it, it will usually happen. Sorry that I didn't realize before. But we want to, to put in the principle, and it's what I was saying, that uh, all the members of Quara uh, address these principles in a, in a similar manner, but then they will have their own action plan as a member level. The, every single institution in Quara has a roadmap and say, well, oh, Yes, we, we are signatories of Quara. We are members of a coalition, and it is a bottom-up initiative. So we want to address things together and share what we learn and just uh, learning by doing. This is what we have a starting sharing in Zenodo, this uh, collection of, I will send you afterwards the link, the collection of action plans at the institutional level is how each is can uh, address the principles. And then another important uh, thing is that um, we have different working groups that they are, is, I don't know how familiar is the audience with the REA, with the Research Data Alliance, that is a bottom-up initiative, also global, to make uh, push the research data in this scenario of the research. So um, in the difference with the Research uh, Data Alliance is that Coara is at institutional level. I'm belonging to REA uh, as an individual member, but I belong into Coara as an institutional member, as a Carlos III University in my case, or whatever is your institution. Why? Because this is a bit difficult to participate in a bottom-up initiative but at the same time, it's interesting because you are committing your institution. So that's the institution, the one that has to address the principles or the one that has to have a roadmap or an action plan for implement these core commitments. And the four base core commitments are very similar to DORA. It's first recognizing the diversity of contributions, uh, use not only Qualitative, uh, quantitative indicators, but uh, also qualitative indicators based on the narrative curriculum and your uh, contribution to the society with your scientific contribution, and abandon the inappropriate use of journal impact factor and every other 
uh, publication-based metrics uh, like H index, for example, and avoiding the use of rankings as a matter of uh, or as a proxy of quality of research organizations. The the fact that we include rankings is because we are members at an institutional level, at an institutional level, people like university rankings and things like that. So those are the four minimum uh, basic principles. Everybody can agree upon that. And so we have other accompanying measures that is sharing with the community, participate in the coalition, uh, contribute with uh, with uh, no money. It's not a question that you have to pay anything, but just put resources on doing the things that you want to, to do. And also joining the different working groups that we have different working groups addressing different topics. Um, both at a topic level, for example, we have a working group on multilingualism and language biases in research assessment, or we have a working group on reforming the academic career as such, or a working group on the uh, research infrastructure that they have to be openly available to do open data, open metadata to do research. And this is the, that comes with the principle 10 of Coara, that is opening up the resources used for evaluation. And this is very much aligned with another declaration, yet another declaration, because there are so many declarations around these topics, which is the Barcelona Declaration that was issued on April 16, and is completely focusing on the uh, on the fact that all the resources that you use for research evaluation should be only available. There is not any more a uh, black box that you say, okay, Clarivate, tell me that this is my impact factor or this is the my age index. Why? Where is those data? Share your data. Uh, and just the other thing is important that they can holds the data itself. It's just like bringing up the responsibility of research evaluation back to academia. So I think one of the big mistakes that we have been doing in the last 50 years is just externalizing the research evaluation to for-profit organizations that they are giving us figures and we believe on them and we pay for that. And nowadays, it's absolutely insane, but it's not necessary to externalize that we measure points because we can bring a better mechanism. And in this uh, work, you know, creating a better mechanism is where Quara is embracing a community, is trying to build up bottom up initiatives that people can just uh, look at what others are doing in the action plan contribute to the working groups that we want to make a new indicator, we want to make an infrastructure to incorporate and the research evaluation multilingualism. I think that for the US, you don't care <laughs> because you, you don't publish any paper in Finnish or in Polish, so you don't care very much. But it's super important that the contributions have different values. And another elephant in the room that I just want to put on the, on the table that is not just from the name of Koara, it's from my own perspective, is how long are we going to believe in the paper as a communication-only mechanism? Is the paper the way that we have to communicate science? In my opinion, it's a 19th century approach to... Uh, communicate the way you do things in the area of uh, interdisciplinarity in the context of the web and the artificial intelligence. I think it's absurd that we keep doing papers. That's just a provocative feelings. feelings. <laughs> this is just all for my side. No problem. I think it's a very good way to start the discussion. Thank you. Eva, thank you for that. And thank you for ending on a provocative question. I think um, lots of us will have uh, opinions on that. Um, and there's um, a lot of <laughs> good uh, point of discussion going on in the in the um, chat sidebar also. So I think uh, 
maybe we'll we'll get started um, with everyone on the panel. With uh, I'll I'll pose a question based on the theme of what's going on in the chat as well. Is you know getting right down to the premise of of this discussion about research assessment um, from from our perspective at the Center for Open Science. We kind of see a tiered approach to research assessment, transparency, reproducibility, replicability, transparency being, you know, can you sort of dig into what the actual methods, the data, the code, the protocols are, reproducibility, you know, can you, uh, can you get that um, up and running? Can you really um, try to, to use the code or understand what the, the data say based on good metadata and definitions and that? And then um, replicability, you know, can you actually rerun those experiments and sort of test the boundaries of, of the empirical finding that's being proclaimed? Um, but that's a heck of a lot <laughs> more. I think that's sort of the, the big problem with um, that we're all trying to solve is that all three of those levels are a lot more difficult than just looking up the number of citations that an article um, had received. And, and hence, we're in the situation where we are, where something that's easy to measure is uh, distracting us from the real scientific importance um, of the question. So, you know, I wonder from your three perspectives, what's the um, what what should the focus be on um, when the phrase research assessment comes along, and, and how do you um, perceive that as a question? I think maybe I'll I'll pass it based on the order that we uh started on. So, um. Haley, I'm sorry to sort of put you on the spot, but if you have a, a response to that. Yeah, yeah, that was, um, it's it's a really good question. And I think, you know, Dora's, you know, Dora's approach and my 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 response as a, as, you know, uh, with my Dora hat on will be probably different from Caitlin's and Eva's responses, since Dora does have such a wide audience and such a, a broad reach. And we're, we're trying to work across you know, this, this very large and complex system. So, I mean, I, I think when I tried to break down the concepts of responsible research assessment, especially for those who maybe are, are new to the conversation, I usually focus on, you know, hiring, promotion, tenure, and funding decisions as, you know, a broad entry point when thinking about, um, research assessment. And then we can, you know, depending on who you're talking to, you can really drill down to um, on the individual, uh, what, uh, the the individual topics that are most relevant to those specific, um, those specific uh, uh, actors. So uh, I think it's, it's a bit of a tough question to answer from Dora's perspective, because we ha do have such a broad audience and, you know, depending on who you're who you're speaking to, that answer will, I think, change. So, um, you know, one of my go-to examples is the use of narrative style CVs, uh, Dora's funder discussion group, um, which is a collection of research funders that are very passionate and have done quite a lot of work to reform their assessment practices, uh, has done a huge amount of work on implementation of narrative CVs, talking about some of the challenges, addressing uh, biases in a more narrative style CV. Um, and, you know, really the purpose of that, that effort is to recognize a broader range of scholarly work. So um, I think, you know, that's usually the baseline that I start from is recognizing a broader range of scholarly work, which then intersects with open scholarship and DEI and all of that. So yes, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a great, great example. And yeah, particularly um, when um, your know, different um, scholarly outputs, different methods uh, are, are used. You have the um, there's a long-standing discussion between qu quantitative and, and qualitative methodologies, um, and, and coming at it from um, you know one specific per perspective, you know, could overvalue that um, that perspective relative to the uh, value given to others. And so I think uh, your response um, sort of highlighting ways to um, provide better assessment that's broader, uh, as broadly as applicable as possible for the wide um, community <laughs> that you serve and represent and, and work with. 
Caitlin, uh, would you like to take a stab at any of these points? Sure. I'll just say, so you asked, I think, like, what should be the focus? And so this sure. is not a policy <laughs> from like the, the hat of, you know, leading this network of 100 plus institutions and their priorities, which is a little bit different. Um, but I think, you know, equity, the global context is incredibly important. Why It's why I... Um, Totally. I know that a lot of attention is put on the U.S. for a lot of things. And there was also a comment in the chat that I totally agree with that we have to consider the global context. And um, Eva rightfully pointed out that Kawara is a global initiative. And it's something that we have brought to our community as like, what can we do here? How can we help? Um, and that's it's really important to, to partner with, you know, Dora and Kawara. And um, we've been inspired by Humetric. So that's my shout out to these amazing um, organizations and community efforts that are that are going on. Um, but I would also say that what, what I hear and what our community hears when we, when we work with institutional, you know, higher education leaders, um, transparency and democracy is huge. Um, Ron Daniels uh, is the president of Johns Hopkins. And right before, or maybe adjacent to the round table, he published a book, What Universities Owe Democracy. And within that, he has an entire chapter on um, open science and really the focus of um, like what COVID-19 did uh, to to research and basically said it's about time we show our work. We don't have three years to wait for publications to come out, um, et cetera. Um, Michael Crow takes a bit of a different approach. He talks about, you know, innovation and climate change. And so um, tackling, you know, some of the problems that Hoarding our data did to the real world. And so in, I, I, higher ed leaders really care again about that transparency, democracy, and then some, you know, and also, you know, societal impact, public access, innovation opportunities. And then we also hear about, um, you know, return on investment. Um, that's something that higher ed leaders care about, competitiveness for grants. That's not, uh, I haven't quite, I, I can't, you know, that that comes with its own challenges and in, in sort of a, like encouraging competition, but I think it is normal. And then another one that we're, we're closely following, some of the higher education associations, and there's a lot of work going on in the engaged scholarship area. And so that is, again, directly a tie to some of the, you know, value propositions of universities and colleges in general. And so if we um, are, we try to be good about our articulating open science and open scholarships connection to that and why you need to explicitly reward the sharing of research outputs in order to en enable those things. Yeah, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, you know, making sure that, that that the act of sharing itself is, um, is as rewarded in every step of the way as possible. Um, and, and I think every type of institution, every type of funder, every type of, you know, journal has a role in making sure that those are recognized as really great research outputs. And, and that also brings up um, Eva's uh, last point kind of about um, getting beyond the, the simple paper as the, the main research dissemination um, vehicle. So uh, Eva, I'll, I'll pass the floor to you just about the, the top, the question at hand of, you know, what's the, um, what's your response to the sort of best way to evaluate research? And, and then we'll pivot to uh, getting beyond the paper. I was just, uh, it was a question. Now it's a boomerang. It came back yeah. to me. <laughs> so uh, uh, I was just thinking and just discussing more about this. Um, I think uh, absolutely the paper is so, um, you know, so stuck in the culture that it will be there for, for, a, for a while. Um, but actually, we, we need to think about more dynamic papers and not based on the uh, the natural way of communicating. And also another thing they want to point it out related with papers, with results evaluation in general, and with everything is that when we talk about peer review in Koara, people just just ah, get uh, on the nerves and they say, no, you cannot evaluate uh, in the peer review because peer review is so biased and it's not scalable. We need indicators, we need the impact factor. Excuse me. To reach an impact factor before you have to have a peer review because the only thing that legitimizes quality in science is peer review. It's not the logo of Elsevier, it's not the logo, it's not like a brand in the Lacoste uh, t-shirt. 
is not a brand will legitimize the quality of science is the peer review before. If there is not a peer review before, you will never have a paper in the Q1. That's it, full stop. So why when we get uh, thinking about a peer review is the most important thing in research evaluation, we don't think that the peer review is the base of evaluating science at paper level. That's an important thinking. And another important thing that we have to be very aware instead of just giving talks and thinking about, oh, we need to change the way we measure science. Oh, it's very difficult. Oh. And in the next conversation, you say, what is your age index? No way. We have to promote new uh, indicators. We have to research, to do meta research, to do research on research, to create new indicators. Because we cannot blame people to use the journal impact factor if we don't make alternatives. That's why I'm so keen on the belief that the community of Quara, uh, the community of research or meta research or research on research will build up new indicators that it will be, I don't think that it will be just better because there is not a perfect indicator, but it's room for improvement. The journal impact factor is absolutely math mathematically incorrect, biased, and based on the um, 60s communication. So we can do it better with artificial intelligence. Yesterday, I was um, I was uh, looking at a tweet that terrified me, that somebody said, imagine a new world when the paper is made by artificial intelligence, the evaluation is made by artificial intelligence, and the publication is made by artificial intelligence. And nobody complained as soon as you get your credit and as soon as you get your impact. So this is the, the way where we are. So we cannot just put a finger in the sun because this is the context where we are producing research, like in 19th century, when the technology of the 21st century is there. So that's my two cents. That's more than two cents. <laughs> There's a lot out there. Um, uh, I'm going to come back to a, a point that uh, Haley made um, in your introductory remarks. Um, and I think it ties to all of these, but it's a little bit of a one-off example of preprints being used to um, garner uh, or, or to clarify recognition of, of research outputs. And we certainly see those as a way to um, tie together a lot of research outputs, the data, um, the, the, the narrative summary that's involved in the, in the preprint paper, um, all the other research materials, um, going, uh, accompanying it. Uh, we would also say like the declaration that the research is about to occur through a, through a registration is something that would be part of that, um, life cycle of a research project that should be the focus. Um, uh, this is all kind of like from COS's perspective. Um, but I'm wondering, um, how you see preprints being um, appropriately recognized and then getting to Eva's point about, you know, peer review really legitimizing um, any sort of a, a assertion coming out. What's the, um, what's the path forward from wh where we see research assessment right now to, to where it should be perhaps with or without preprints? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to kind of kick off that. I, you know, I think there are a lot of things that the declaration doesn't specifically, you know, talk about. And Dora released a um, a really fantastic um, piece on the intersections between responsible research assessment, open scholarship, and uh, equity efforts. And, um, you know, even though open scholarship is not specifically mentioned in the declaration, um, it's long been very deeply intertwined with responsible research assessment. Um, I don't think you can disentangle, you know, efforts to uh, foster transparency and openness um, in data and recognizing that uh, without also incorporating that into hiring, promotion, tenure, and funding processes. Um, so, you know, I think these two things are very tightly intertwined. Preprints themselves, 
I think are a really exciting way. Um, so I, I referenced a, a really exciting way for early career researchers to evidence their work, um, given the you know amount of time that it can take for public a full publication to come out. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer to reconciling, um, you know, the the review and the trust aspect. I think we're working towards that. Um, there are a lot of really fantastic, uh, you know, organizations that are doing that. I would highlight ASAP Bio and their work around preprint peer review and trying to really drill into, you know, principles and recommendations around fostering support and, and trust for pre preprint peer review uh, as a really great resource. So, you know, Dora's recommendations to recognize a broad range of scholarly work, I think, you know, encompasses preprints uh, and encompasses, you know, the open uh, scholarship practices that go and all of that. Um, so, I, you know, I think it's an evolving topic, but, uh, you know, certainly falls under the, the broad um, umbrella of Dora's recommendations to recognize a wide range of uh, scholarly outputs. So, yeah. Anything to add, either of you, or I'll move. I'm going to move to um, kind of like a sort of closing argument. Our 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 time <laughs> flies when we're sort of really digging into this, and this is why we're having kind of a series of these because each time we get like into the meat of a conversation, it um, uh, time passes. But um, uh, we've been having these conversations for for years, of course, and you know, roughly the past ten years have seen a whole lot of um, conversations and, and movement on all of these topics. You know. What do you think the big challenges are for the, for the next 10 years? Um, what strategies need to, to occur um, so that um, 10 years from now, we're, we're having a, a more advanced conversation about um, how much um, progress has actually been made in these areas? What, what do you think the next 10 years should have in store? Um, Caitlin, I'll, I'll go with you, then, then Eva, and then wrap it up with Haley. Yeah, I think um, so. I will say that I think you know the the toughest challenge is well for now is um, not getting again leadership buy in that this is important. That I think you know Helios Open can say you know we we check that box with a lot of room to grow, um, but it's getting the campuses to the implementation phase and then sharing that out. And so um, for us, a win is you know having five institutions in the U.S. basically carrying forward a reform effort. And then we would shout that from the rooftops. And I think, you know, that first mover problem is really difficult, but there's some, you know, making some progress there. Um, the Nelson Mem Memorandum in the U.S. really, again, blew the door wide open. And so seeing those plans emerge about, you know what, they're they're starting to get a little bit more specific about things like persistent identifiers, um, reuse of research, so specific licenses. So some of the, the things that, um, could push us along a bit more. So, you know, some agencies are uh, have included software and code as part of their requirements for sharing. So that can help advance not only, um, hey, we need to basically, the behaviors of researchers on U.S. campuses, but then um, go start to also what Eva talked about, address some of the other research outputs that might also be incentivized at institutions. And so um, software, code, data, persistent identifiers, knowing that agents, all of the agencies in the U.S. are coming out with plans to address those types of research outputs and those specific um, things that contribute to transparency and reuse of research helping campuses get up to speed with their own policies and, and kind of showing them evidence that this is happening in a major sector that they care about. Um, that's an opportunity for the next 10 years as along with what I said at first, which is, you know, getting those first movers to share their stories and inspire that kind of peer pressure we want to see um, going on as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I also, you know, emphasize the point that the Nelson Memo expanded upon the definition of what data is, um, and the precise wording I'll get a little bit wrong, but it's you know, all the information needed to validate and, I'm not sure if these replicate or, or reproduce, but validate and uh, replicate research findings is, is what is defined as, as data um, in that. Um, and some of the agencies, as you mentioned, are really expanding upon that and detailing what those are. 
Um, and as each agency comes out with their um, draft plans for, for compliance, that's something that we're taking a look at to making sure that they're really taking that definition to heart. Um, Eva, what, what, what do you think needs to happen in the next 10 years? Well, that's the $1 million yeah. question, because we can just go back and Holly probably can tell you more what has been happening the last 10 years since Dora. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very, um, I, I have to, I, I don't have time. I mean, science don't have time. The world don't have time. The climate change doesn't have time to, to, uh, for us to come up with the indicator or to come up with something else. I think the problem in the next 10 years, the real challenge is that we have to change the way we uh, assess the scientific world. At the same time, we pay for the current system. And this is absolutely uh, uh, unsustainable because we can, I will be very happy to say, just close the scientific communication current mechanism for two years. It will not be closed because uh, people will still share what they are doing and it will be a lot of uh, ways of communicating just naturally. But uh, we cannot afford to do that. The problem is that if we can invest all the money that we are investing in the old-fashioned system, in the system that new science needs, it will be very important. It will be a very uh, efficient way to do it. But we cannot close science for two years. This is my dream, and I will be very happy to do it, but nobody will agree about that. So I think in the next 10 years, we have to, we will be just um, uh, challenging these things, keep paying subscription, keep paying uh, all uh, traditional system. At the same time, we evolve creating new ways of evaluating, new ways of communicating, in science, new ways of uh, getting credit, and new ways of um, merging careers without uh, base on the quantitative publication system. So uh, probably it will be the 10 years of the data sharing, uh, make data count again, uh, of the 10 years of uh, reproducibility and demonstration of the real ethical value of your research. Uh, it's impossible that a, a person publish 200 papers a year. So that's the highly cited uh, researchers. They are in this league. It is impossible. It is absolutely insane. And I think the papers nowadays, they are not read even for the autops. If you publish 200 papers a year, you don't read even your papers. So I think the challenge is that. The, uh, address the quantitative bias and um, and also uh, to challenge the the cost of maintaining the monster that we have created at the same time that we are creating a new a smoothly way to communicate and to evaluate science. Thank you. Yeah, and and and, and Haley, can you wrap us up um, in just a few words? What do you think? <laughs> they, uh needs to happen in 10 years. <laughs> yep. Um, so uh, I will try to, I'll take an aspirational uh, approach uh, since I think Eva and Caitlin have already given really lovely, thoughtful um, uh, outlines of uh, different, different topics. So I think that uh, in, in 10 years, if um, what what needs to happen in 10 years uh, is that we've had a lot of, over the past 10 years, we've had a lot of, you know, research funding organizations, academic institutions implementing new practices and new policies. And I think we're entering into an era where organizations like uh, Research on Research Institute, Rory, are playing incredibly important roles, taking that work and translating it into, uh, you know, qualitative studies and um, studies to better understand the impact of those policies and practices. And that will then help us give a give us a really 
great basis to you know continue this work to iterate on it and to improve it with transparency and rigor um, so I, I think that that is going to be an incredibly important piece over the next 10 years to continue this movement forward uh, yeah I absolutely agree and um, uh, just uh, I want to thank each of you very much for giving your time um, for sharing the work that you're doing um, with our audience and um, and you know keep on uh, keep on doing the hard work that that we see happening um, so that 10 years from now we can um, be talking more about uh, <laughs> how great the utopian uh, world we live in at this point is <laughs> we might get there but we can at least have a goal that we're working towards so thank you very much um, for your time and for your work thank we will you. talk again before 10 years yes absolutely <laughs> thank you so much <laughs>